there was a Morehouse man, a Hampton man, and a Howard University man. And they were all up in heaven fighting for the right hand seat of God. And God says, enough of this foolishness. The Howard man will sit to my right and the Hampton man will sit to my left. And the Morehouse man was left standing there, tapping his feet. And God says, yes, and what do you want? And the Morehouse man says, God, I do believe you're sitting in my seat. No, Morehouse men are the, not that arrogant. Much more, actually. <laughs> Good morning, my dearest brothers. <laughs> I said, Good morning, my dearest brothers. My name is Dr. Alexander Daniel Hamilton VI, and I bring greetings to you on behalf of the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter, Sr the longest serving dean of the largest religious edifice in the world, solely dedicated to the working teachings and even musings of that great African-American prophet and freedom trumpeteer, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On this occasion, however, Dean Carter, the chapel assistants and I welcome you to this magnificent edifice to celebrate the man who inspired the theological underpinnings that launched the revolutionary undertakings, that upended the solidified institutional discrimination and shook the very foundations of power that ultimately transformed a nation and caused the world to take notice. We welcome you to this here Howard Washington Thurman Crown Forum of 2014. Much has been made of Howard Thurman's statement regarding the crown that Morehouse holds over its students. At first blush, it's easy to assume that Dr. Thurman is suggesting that the destiny of every Morehouse man is to be a king, to rule over, and the, and the crown fit for the king is his rightful inheritance and signal to take his place amongst all the great emperors that come before him. But au contraire, mon frere, such a manifest destiny type of interpretation of Thurman's remarks goes against the very essence of Thurman's teachings and ultimately the historical aim for Morehouse College. We are not here to flaunt our academic accomplishment in a world full of pain and suffering. We are not here to engage in philosophical and theological and ontological and epistemological reductionism. Oh no, under circumstance, we will never, under no circumstance will we ever dumb down the Morehouse brand. Instead, we must go deeper into understanding exactly what Thurman is trying to convey to us. You see, the crown, that crown, is not so much a crown of royalty as it is a crown of thorns. And the magnificence of the crowning moment is not whether you stand up to put the crown on, oh no, my friend, but when they push the crown of thorns down upon your head, will you be man enough not to take it off? Will you stand on what you believe until the world takes notice? Or will you cower in the prophetic moment when people are counting on you to take a stand? Will you be a man who lives his life on principle, courage, and conviction? Or will you simply ignore the ills of a traumatic world that acts contrary to divine creation and reduces human beings to haves, have-nots, and have-mores? In this poisonous atmosphere 
of unethical and immoral behavior, when human beings are refusing to live up to their better selves, who will you be in that moment? Will you be willing to put your reputation on the line to bring honor, character, and all your integrity to bear? All to bring light to the darkness of a sick, conflict-ridden, trial and tribulated world? Who will you be in that moment? Will you be your better self when the stakes are sky high, or will you take the moral pass? This is the question that Howard Thurman asked of us today. Yes, take the crown, take it. But when they push the crown of thorns down upon your head and the blood begins to trickle, under no circumstances shall you ever take it off. Let us please stand for a moment of prayer and join hands one with another. And with the spirit of Howard Washington Thurman, let us center ourselves and silence our hearts. God, you are our peace, our help in ages past, and our strength that propels us into the future. As we have negotiated the tasks and temptations of college life, God, you have been the strength beyond our strength that gives strength to our strength. You have been a faithful companion guiding us as we pursue greater days, greater possibilities, greater visions, and greater expectations for ourselves. You have been an eternal promise keeper and a way maker when all others would neglect us. And for all of these blessings, we say thank you. And as we reach the culmination of another semester and move to another stage of our academic journey, remind us that we, you will be with us in the end as you have been with us in the beginning. There is no place where you are not. There is no problem that you cannot solve. And there is no separation so great that will sever our union with your spirit. We express a commitment to show up in the world with the conviction to express the sound of the genuine and daily becoming ourselves, unconsciously giving others the permission to do the same. We seal this prayer knowing that all is already well. And it is with your name and nature that we collectively say, Amen. There is a profound difference between what we should do with our lives and what we are meant to do with our lives. There's a profound difference between what we should be in the world and what we are meant to be in the world. The difference is this. The idea of what we should do and be comes from outside of ourselves, from the society in which we live, from the fantasies that our parents and loved ones have had about our lives, from our misguided ideas about what will make us acceptable to other people. On the other hand, the idea of what we are meant to do and be comes from a source deep within us. It comes from the still, small voice that calls us to pursue our true passion and our divine mission, that urges us to give our unique gifts to the world. This voice within is what Howard Thurman called the sound of the genuine. In fact, it was Howard Thurman, Morehouse College class of 1923, who said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Thurman invites us to look within, to reverse the searchlight of our awareness away from the distractions of the world, to find the luminous brilliance of our own uniqueness, and to shine our light in a world 
full of people who are fast asleep. The Renaissance artist and sculpture, sculptor Michelangelo, when he was asked how he created his stunning works of art, gave a strange answer. According to Michelangelo, the statues already existed within the marble. God was the true creator of the David and the thinker. His job as the artist was to chip away at the excess marble and to reveal what God had already created. The fact is that it is the same for each of us. Our job in this world is to chip away at the excess marble, the excess fears and doubts, the excess negative opinions and limiting attitudes, and yes, the excess laziness and excuses, and to reveal the beautiful work of art that the Creator has already formed within us. And I must add that as sons of Morehouse College, we have a responsibility to do even more than that. To borrow a metaphor from C.S. Lewis, let us imagine that the entire world is a great sculptor's shop. The, the whole world is Michelangelo's studio, full of statues that appear so real that they are almost human. They have the eyes of a human being. They stand like human beings. They are the size and shape of human beings. Still, there is a crucial difference between a statue and a human being. Statues, unlike people, do not have life. They cannot see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. They cannot feel or hope or love or believe. But let us imagine, as C.S. Lewis puts it, that there is a rumor going around the shop that some of us statues are going to come to life coming to life. This is the Herculean task of the sons of Morehouse. We are charged with the duty to go beyond merely reflecting the divine image within us. We must bring that image to life. We must not be statues. We must feel and hope and love and believe. We must do more good in the world than simply seeking for our own success and security. Because, brothers, there is a profound difference between looking like a human being and actually being one. There's a profound difference between looking like a success and actually being one. There is a profound difference between what we're told we should be and what we're meant to be. Follow your bliss, says Joseph Campbell, and the universe will open doors where there were only walls. But the fact is that statues cannot walk through doors. Only human beings can do that. Yes, there is a rumor going around that some of us statues are coming alive. Come alive, brothers, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Thank you. welcome home today one of the sainted sons of the Morehouse class of 2008, the Reverend Mr. Craig Thomas Robinson, Jr., proud pastor of the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church that serves the village of Bay Shore and Long Island, New York. Reverend Robinson, former vice president of the Martin Luther King Jr. Chapel Assistants, is committed to ministry that embraces both the head, the heart, and our hands. He holds a bachelor's of arts degree in history from Morehouse, a master's of divinity, and master's of sacred theology degrees from Yale University Divinity School. At Yale, Reverend Robinson demonstrated a high scholastic aptitude. In 2011, he was awarded two prizes in the area of preaching, the Charles S. Mercick Prize for Effective Public Address, especially in preaching, and the Oliver Ellsworth Daggert Prize for Ability, Diligence, Christian Character, and promise of usefulness 
as a preacher. He's also published in the African American Pulpit Journal and the African American Lectionary Online. One of his Yale professors and I served together on the Fetzer Institute's Advisory Council for Education Professions in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And at one of our recess sessions, he informed me that Craig was perhaps the most promising student he ever taught. Reverend Robinson's second graduate degree, that is the Master of Sacred Theology, was an exploration into the life and legacy of Howard Washington Thurman. And that is one of the reasons I chose him to be the speaker today. And this thesis deals with Howard Thurman's prophetic ministry at the Fellowship Church, probably one of the nation's first integrated congregations in San Francisco, and with his deanship at Marsh Chapel at Boston University the chapel where I served as associate dean before coming to be the dean of King Chapel. Reverend Robinson is a Lillian Dow Transition into Ministry Fellow, and he's an instructor in the AME Program for Liturgy and Hymnody for the New England Annual Conference, and an instructor of church history in the New York Conference. He is a friend and a brother beloved. He walked through Morehouse with great humility, even though he's over six feet. Now, my fellow learners, won't you stand to your feet and give him a Morehouse welcome. You may be seated.
President Wilson, the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter, Sr., Dean of the Chapel, the Reverend Dr. Alexander Daniel Hamilton VI, the Assistant Dean, Mr. Devon Crawford, President of the Chapel Assistants, and to all of the Chapel Assistants, the trustees, faculty, and the great students of Morehouse College, guests and friends all, good morning. Thank you, Dean Carter, for this gracious, for your gracious introduction and for your in invitation to come home to Morehouse. Thank you for your mentorship and your friendship, for your inspiration and your leadership. Your mark is still very much written on my heart. I owe a great deal of the, my ministry and its trajectory to your leadership. Thank you for being a great dean and for accepting an AME preacher. amongst this august company of Baptists. Amen. And to Dean Hamilton, a great friend. We struggled together at YBS last year, and it was a struggle. But he is a prophet of the, for the nation, an agitator for the right, he is my friend, and I'm glad about it. Thank you, Dean Hamilton, for who you are to me. And to all of those who serve in the chapel, Reverend Walker and Candace Wilcox, thank you for doing what needed to be done to make this day possible and for bringing me here. Thank you. And to Dr. Brian Marks for his tireless service in making sure that Crown Forum is as stellar an event as it should be. I want you to consider again some more words of Howard Thurman, this time taken from one of his meditations from an apostle of sensitiveness, that's his word, entitled, The Contradictions of Life Are Not Final. He says, and I quote, at long last, man must be deeply convinced that the contradictions of life which he encounters are not final, that the radical tension between good and evil as he sees it and feels it does not have the last word on the meaning of life and the nature of existence. That there is a spirit in man and in the world working always against the thing that destroys and cuts down. Thus he will live wisely and courageously his little life and those who see the sunlight in his face will drop their tools and follow him. There is no ultimate negation for the man for whom it is categorical that the ultimate destiny of man on this planet is a good destiny. Earlier this week, while deeply engaged in a Facebooking session, I encountered a Facebook status that arrested my attention. The status update came from one of my childhood friends from Ferguson, Missouri, who is now an AME Zion minister in South Carolina. His, his status was a message to the people of St. Louis and especially to the citizens of Ferguson. In his short missive, he implored the citizens of that small suburban city to explore nonviolent options for expressing their displeasure should the grand jury results of the Darren Wilson case be unsatisfactory. I 
said a silent prayer from my hometown, now gripped by tension and cumbered by unrest. Seems that everyone is bracing themselves for the worst, convinced that if the verdict is not satisfactory, there will be a repeat of the rioting and looting that took place in August. People are still angry, and rightfully so. Michael Brown was one of our community's sons. And as one of the sons, he was a valuable piece of our community's future, no matter how the media seeks to portray him. Alas, he is now one more name added to an ever-expanding list of slain black and brown children. The tragedy that is Ferguson tells the sad tale of a nation still divided along lines of race and class. Moreover, the events that have unfolded expose us all to the raw reality that our nation, with all of its innovation and progress, is not whole and is in desperate need of healing. Ferguson, Missouri, and a host of other cities where black and brown children have been slain are startling reminders that there is still work to be done to heal our land and bring all God's people together. The daunting nature of the task ahead is enough to make even the strongest man or woman weep bitter tears. Tears of frustration because the answers to our society's problems are not immediately accessible. Tears of hopelessness because despite our best efforts, we cannot seem to see our way through the madness. Tears of sorrow because it seems that the dreams of our fathers, forefathers and foremothers seem to have entered deferment with the death of one more son or daughter, brother or sister. I must confess that the tension of my hometown overtook the writing of, and revisions of this speech, which was supposed to be a, celebrate, a celebratory speech about the incomparable Howard Washington Thurman. Yet with all the madness swirling around my head, it was a wonder that I could even bring myself to celebrate at all. Yet on this day, it is imperative that we celebrate. Not because we wish to join in a delusion that there is nothing wrong with the world. No, we celebrate today as affirmation that we here at Morehouse College refuse to live and grieve as those who have no hope. If we are going to celebrate Howard Washington Thurman properly, if we are going to remember him for who he was and for what his life means to the soul of our nation and this school, we must remember one essential element that, uh, that allowed Howard Thurman's personality and spirituality to flourish. Hope. The hope of a bright future uh, for this tempest-tossed land. He knew, as our reading has indicated, that in the end, evil, hatred, and division would not have the last word on the human story. Here, Thurman's hope-filled words again, this time taken from his book, The Search for the Common Ground, and I quote, the radical tension between good and evil as man sees it and feels it does not have the last word about the meaning of life and the nature of existence. There is a spirit in man and in the world that is working against the thing that destroys and lays waste. Always he must know that the contradictions of life are not final or ultimate. What are the contradictions of life? The contradiction of, contradictions of life are those systems both internal to the individual and external to the environment that work against one's potential and purpose. Those people, places, and things, activities, and beliefs that do not build up but tear down. Those choices made individually or in a community that block progress, stifle development, and hinder 
growth. For Thurman, it was the presence of racial prejudice, the evils of race-based terrorism, the isolation of racial segregation. These were contradictions to life. These experiences were considered contradictions because they were in opposition to Thurman's hard-held belief that Brother Dane Jones just uh, um, uh, enlightened us to, that life is alive. To believe that life is alive is to have the awareness that the universe is dynamic. It gives to the individual the quiet assurance that wherever he may be located in him, the immediate candidacy for the strength that comes from boundless vitality. Life is dynamic. Life is always moving, always changing, always building and growing. Every living being is part of the aliveness of life. And when the potential of life is denied or cut off or blocked, it is an opponent to the very plan of the universe, the plan of God. In his book, The Search for Common Ground, Thurman asserts that God, the creator, intended for the world and all its creatures to experience a full and abundant life. As Thurman puts it, God intended for there to be a space for me to be me and for you to be you as we build community around our expressions of the genuine. This was the intent of creation. God intended for us to have whole and full lives, whole as individuals and whole as a community. Anything less than this is a contradiction to the life God intended. Anything less is no life at all. So where does Thurman lead us this morning? I believe he is leading us away from the forces that give life's contradictions power. He leads us to wholeness by first reminding us of the inherent value of our individual lives. He, we must never forget that we have value in ourselves. The contradictions contradictions of this life will have us think that there is no value in the African-American male. Perhaps it is this mindset that allows our justice system to incarcerate so many of our brothers. And we can rehearse all the startling statistics all day long and they will be but a review for most of us here because many of us have come from places that give the, these, the numbers to these statistics. We've seen it and heard it all. Unfortunately, however, some of us have bought into the lies and we suffer from not seeing our life as, as valuable and we do not live our lives as if they are valuable. We look in the mirror and are blinded by some pain or hurt, unable to see the greatness that is in us. Now some of you might be saying that you're talking to a group of Morehouse men and men of Morehouse. They know already that they are valuable and they know that they are great and you're wasting your breath, Reverend Robinson. But in my humble opinion, to tell a group of African American men that they are great and that they are valuable is not a waste of breath. We must always remember that we have value and that is why the Morehouse is such a beautiful place for any African American male to be because as the, this place helped me to see my value like no other place could. This place showed me the, the strength that I had and, and also the places where I need to grow. This is what the college education that we receive here at Morehouse should do in exposing us to all the diverse offerings of life and the places where we can grow and the ideas and experiences that can pull us out of the blind acceptance that I am somehow less than valuable. Indeed, to be celebrated as a child of God is the very essence of what this place was built for. Hear this message today. You are valuable and all life, all black life matters. 
You are the creative expression of God's genius. Hear it not just with your ears, though, but feel it in your soul. We have to believe in the reality of our life's value, that every experience, every mistake, every triumph, every man and woman and child we encounter in this life, every setback, every comeback, every single solitary part of our life's journey has meaning and value. We have to believe it at the level of our soul because no one else is obligated to do so. Thurman is leading us to value our lives, not to squander the gift that God has given us on low things, but he's also leading us to value our dreams. Now, I sat through many crown forums less than, no less than six years ago, and I heard people say the same thing. And I used to sit in those seats and say, not another discourse about dreams. I said it to myself and I said it to my friends more than I, times than I can count. Perhaps I said that to myself because I has of yet did not believe my dreams could be actualized. Thurman taught me that dreaming is a foundational act of life. In one of his meditations of the heart, Thurman asserts, as long as a man keeps alive a dream in the heart, he will not lose the significance of living. My dreams give me substance, give substance to my life. My dreams animate my passions. My dreams bolster my resolve. My dreams color how I experience the world. My dreams are the stuff of ultimate meaning at my life's core. Those dreams are valuable. One of Thurman's biographers called Howard Thurman a practical dreamer. The th dreams Thurman had and the one you, ones you and I have are not for the arena of fantasy, but they are meant to be explored and eventually materialized. When was the last time you took your dreams seriously? Or have you allowed the hard things of life to convince you that dreaming is futile? It is the act of dreaming that gives way to visions of the future where we are able to see beyond the contradictions of life so that our lives never lose their meaning and significance. Thus far, Thurman's words have been used to usher us beyond the power of the contradictions of life. The question remains, what is on the other side of those contradictions? What awaits us at the convergence of our lives and the substance of our dream? What is beyond the contradiction? And I might sound like a preacher, I might sound like I'm about to go into some religious speak, but I do believe this is what is beyond the contradictions. I believe beyond the contradictions of life, there is a call, a prophetic call, Dr. Hamilton. It is a call to see something that has never been seen before, to see a new and better world for all humanity, to see clearer and farther than this world is currently able to see. The man of Morehouse and the Morehouse man is called to see through the grit and grime of life to a brand new day, to see beyond the madness of the world to the world that God always intended to have. To have to see it and to proclaim it as well, to tell everybody wherever you are in your life that there is a better way to live. There is a better way and a better time. There is a better way to do what we are doing. There is a better way and that way is the world of our dreams as the president of this college has called it.
a peaceful world, an equitable world, an emancipated world, a sustainable world. Maybe some might call it an Eden or a New Jerusalem, a place of reconciliation, restoration, and rest. Yes, beyond the contradictions of life, past the life-choking circumstances of the world's insanity, there is the vision of the world of our dreams, Howard Thurman's dream. Martin Luther King's dream, Coretta Scott King's dream, Gandhi's dream, Mary McLeod Bethune's dream, and dare I say it, God's dream. Each one of us, by virtue of sitting here today, has been tapped to be a prophet to the world. Wherever you are in life's journey, you must commit yourself to the work of peace building, fellowship, and community. Wherever you are and whatever your life decides, whatever path you decide to go, you must commit yourself to the great work of creating diverse communities full of unabashed welcome, gathering in all those who have been left out and overlooked. Wherever you are and wherever, whatever you decide to do with your life when you leave here, make sure you never perpetuate the same death-dealing practices you see around you. You are the prophets of Thurman's dream. Prophets who have seen the promised land. Prophets who proclaim that there is a better way. But also like the Old Testament prophet Nehemiah, you are also architects anointed to give your hands and hearts to make this vision a reality. And as you build, never forget that the contradictions of this life are not final or ultimate. Evil will not have the last word. Ferguson, Missouri, and Sanford, Florida, and Detroit, Michigan, and Chicago, Illinois are not the final chapters in this life, in our life's book. One ancient sage declared very emphatically that death has been swallowed up in victory. Therefore, not, let us not grow weary in well-doing, and let us not grieve like those who have no hope. For our heritage as men of Morehouse and Morehouse men is not built on such negativity. We do not stand on the foundation of despair, but of great hope. Hope in the midst of civil war and reconstruction. Hope in the midst of the Ku Klux Klan terrorism. Hope in the midst of economic uncertainty. Hope in the midst of low student enrollment. Hope in the midst of the changing tides of the American landscape. Hope in the midst of a few, hope in the midst of the contradictions of life. A future with hope is our sure foundation. That on the other side of our struggles and on the other side and beyond the contradiction and the crucifixions and the thorny crowns of life, there is life beyond those contradictions and there is a world that we can only dream of but that, that we are also able to build. And should we hold fast to that vision Bravely and creatively building while it is yet day. One day and one day soon, we will have built the world of our dreams. And all flesh shall see it together. Won't you all now stand for announcements and our final ritual? Please rise. We have prepared today two meals, a luncheon for 60 and a dinner for 40. Both are hosted by the chapel assistants the luncheon will be in the African American Hall of Fame. We have about 20 chapel assistants here today, so that leaves you do the math.
first come, first serve. We have on the platform today, in case you missed it, two people from Ferguson, Missouri, natives of Ferguson. If you'd like to dialogue about Thurman with our preacher on the themes, we welcome you to the luncheon. I now invite the president of the chapel assistants and Mr. Jones to take the reef with Thurman's tomb down to the floor, and chapel assistants to proceed behind them two by two, which is our annual ritual. Most of you are aware that the Thurmans, Howard and Sue Bailey, are, their remains are interred in the obelisk. But he was the first African American to meet face to face with Mahatma Gandhi and interview him for a half a day on the relevance of nonviolence for ending American segregation. The speaker this evening is Dr. Marvin A. McMickle, president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School in Rochester, New York. This is Martin King's Divinity School. When Martin King attended there, it was in a suburb of Philadelphia in Chester. He's gonna speak on the pulpit and politics. Now won't you lock arms for our hymn. <laughs> 